Okay, maybe I, I, I say a word on the um, laureates of, um, of 2021. So um, on Monday, the, the Nobel uh, of this year was awarded to um, David Card. Um, so yes, actually when we say the Nobel, Nobel Prize, it's a shortcut for the Sveriges Riksbank Prize. So Sveriges Riksbank is the central bank of Sweden in economic science in memory of Alfred Nobel. It's not really a Nobel Prize like the, the five others. It was created uh, in, uh, in 59. No, uh, 69, sorry, 69, so uh, I don't know, 70 years after the, the first uh, Nobel Prize and, uh, and by the Central Bank of Sweden, not, uh, not from the, the, the wish of uh, Alfred Nobel. Um, so uh, David Card uh, shares uh, half the prize, it means it will get uh, half of the million uh, uh, dollars uh, for his empirical contribution to labor economics. And uh, Joshua Engrist and Guido Imbens uh, share the rest of the prize for their methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. So uh, the, the three of them um, are at the forefront of the empirical turn that uh, economist, economics has taken in the 90s. Um, so, we, which is due to, to two factors. The first one is that we started to accumulate a lot of data and having the computing power to analyze it. And the second one is that um, economics before that uh, ha had a lack of uh, credibility. Um, so, so labor economics was the, at the, the forefront of this uh, change. Basically, people were putting into question the results because they were not really uh, proven or really well proven statistically. And um, thanks to uh, these three uh, uh, Nobel laureates, um, economics has changed for, for good. Um, and, uh, and now is, is very much more, um, um, how do we say, exigent? We said that in English. The, it's uh, very much more demanding um, in terms of uh, how you, you prove something. Uh, this is uh, what we call the credibility revolution. Um, so they raised the bar in terms of causal inference. So uh, they, they introduced new techniques to prove that uh, something, is, to, to show the causal effect of a variable on another, or of a policy on some variable. Uh, Alan Kruger was a co-author of Card and Engrist, and uh, he committed suicide in 2019, so he cannot share the prize because the prize is only awarded to living people, but he would have surely deserved it. Uh, he's part of this, uh, of this uh, credibility revolution as well. So this announcement is not a surprise. Uh, they were somehow the, the favorites. Uh, and uh, they, they, yeah, they, all of them are among the, the top economists in terms of a uh, citation uh, H index. H index is the number of papers they have. Uh, okay, it's, no, it's better with an example. When you have an X, H index of 44, uh, it means that uh, Gaido Imbens had 44 papers with at least 44 citations for each paper. Uh, and it's a lot. Um, so they, they, all of them hold a PhD from uh, top universities in the US and, uh, and, hold, and teach um, also in, uh, in top universities in the US. Uh, David Card um, has gotten the, the John Bates Clark Medal. Um, which is an award for the, the best uh, American economist or economist uh, that works in the US under 40. And it's a good predictor of uh, the Nobel Prize because uh, half of the people who got the John Spades Clark Medal before the year 2000 eventually get, got a Nobel Prize. And uh, they, they hold or held um, editorial position in the, in the best journals uh, in economists and also are related to other famous economists, other as PhD students, supervisor, or even spouse. So what did they do? Um, 
There is a famous uh, paper by uh, David Card and Alan Kruger that uh, popularized the difference and difference, diff and diff uh, methodology to prove causality and on the question of uh, minimum wage. So they look at um, reform uh, of the minimum wage in New Jersey. The minimum wage uh, increased uh, by uh, 20% on a given day in 92. Uh, while it remained at the low level uh, in the, the neighboring states of Pennsylvania. What they did is they serve, yeah, so the naive approach uh, to, to estimate the causal effect of uh, an increase in the minimum wage on employment would be to, to compare uh, the employment before and after uh, in New Jersey. But the problem is that you can have confounding factors uh, like um, you can have omitting, omitted variables, like for example the, the change in uh, macroeconomic condition for the region in this year. Uh, maybe the, there is a national recession or a boom and, uh, and this has nothing to do with the legislation. So uh, you can, it would be flawed to just compare before and after. So um, what they, they did is uh, to compare the change in unemployment in New Jersey relative to Pennsylvania. So that's why it's called difference in difference because you have two differences. You look at the, the change in employment before and after the reform and the difference in this change between New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And the idea is that uh, because these are neighboring states, everything, every omitted variable uh, that is uh, relevant uh, to New Jersey would, would also evolve in the same way in Pennsylvania. If there is a, a change in macroeconomic condition, it will probably be the same uh, in both sides of the border. So uh, the identification assumption here, uh, the, um, what we mean by identification assumption is the assumption we need to uh, be certain that the coefficient we estimate it really measures uh, what we have in mind. Uh, in this case, the causal effect of the minimum wage increase on employment. The identification assumption here is that um, if there had been no minimum wage increase, so no treatment, employment would have evolved in the same way in both states. And um, by uh, looking at the Pennsylvania as a control group, uh, you capture all kinds of omitted variable who, which would have evolved in the same way in both states. So the, 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 assum the identification assumption uh, can be violated if there is something special happening to New Jersey at this precise date. Uh, at the same time, for example, if there is another uh, law that is passed at the same time as the minimum wage. And, um, and yeah, so, so to, to be sure that the identification assumption makes sense, uh, researchers need to, to, to show that uh, it was not the case. And uh, here it's credible because, yeah. So their finding is uh, small, but, but uh, very small, actually positive, but, but small, and not really significant effect of an increase in the minimum wage on employment which goes uh, counter to uh, many economic theories which would have um, predicted a decrease in employment. The common but wrong at interpretation is that the higher minimum wage uh, increases employment, if anything, or at least doesn't uh, decrease employment. Uh, why is it wrong? First, uh, this is just a particular case Okay, we're just looking at uh, New Jersey in the 90s with a specific level of minimum wage. Perhaps uh, at this level of minimum wage, you can increase it, it will increase employment. But if the minimum wage is higher, uh, then uh, increasing it will, uh, would uh, decrease employment. Uh, second, they, they only look, so they study here, um, fast food restaurants. So they, they, they sample uh, fast food restaurants in these uh, two, two states and they look at employments there. But uh, fast food are, are particular because uh, poor people um, go more to fast food than, than rich people 
And uh, when you have an increase in the minimum wage, then it increases the income and the consumption of poor people. So maybe it's a demand effect that leads to uh, this increase in employment in the fast food industry, and maybe you don't have the same increase in employment in the, in the state as a whole. So actually in their paper, they show that uh, in the state as a whole, uh, results are mixed. So employment increases for, um, for uh, teenagers, uh, and, and decreases for uh, adults, but, uh, but teenagers are much more subject to the minimum wage than adults, and at the same time there was a recession. So there, are, there is mixed evidence at the state level, but that was not their point uh, anyway. The, um, the good interpretation is that the, mo the, exist the existing models of, uh, of the labor markets at the time of the, the, the study uh, failed. Um, the, the prediction of these models um, were inconsistent with uh, their observation. And this is what they wanted to, to prove in this paper. And this made, paper made it to posterity with the, thanks to the new methodology uh, it introduced. So uh, what they did is exploiting a natural experiment. So uh, an, an experiment is uh, when a researcher um, decides a setting, uh, controls the setting, uh, uses uh, generally a control group and a treatment group, and observes the effect of the treatment because, uh, uh, directly because the, the two groups are taking, uh, taken randomly. Uh, in economics, you, you, you often cannot do that. I mean, sometimes you can do that, and, um, and this is what uh, experimental economists do. Uh, they, they usually um, use uh, students in the lab and, and uh, put them into random groups. But this is uh, a natural experiment where you use uh, quasi-random, uh, quasi-exogenous uh, variation that happen in the real world uh, to measure the causal effects you're interested in. So using a similar methodology, David Card uh, studied uh, immigration and uh, found uh, no effect or very small effect of immigration on um, the employment and the wages of uh, natives. The, 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 the thing he exploited uh, is the, the arrival of, uh, I think, 100,000 uh, uh, Cuban uh, migrants in, um, in Miami at a given uh, year, and, uh, and studies which, which increased the um, the, the supply of, of uh, low-skilled labor by 7%, and uh, compare this to the evolution of the labor markets uh, in the same period uh, in other towns like Los Angeles or Houston uh, that didn't experience the increase, uh, the, the migration uh, inflow. So um, he also uh, contributed to literature on um, education, uh, by measuring correctly the returns to schooling. And that's a good transition to uh, Joshua Engrist, uh, who worked extensively uh, on education as well. So Engrist and Kruger popularized the instrumental variables uh, method, uh, which is a method to pin down uh, causal effects. And um, in their paper uh, of 91, that answers the question, what is the return to one additional year of schooling in terms of uh, future earnings? Um, because, yeah, there are, maybe, uh, maybe schooling uh, is important because, uh, because you, people learn uh, useful stuff, or maybe it's not, and, uh, and the reason why more educated people um, earn more than no educated people is just uh, a correlation. Uh, it's, uh, it's signaling, for example, those who have the capacities to, to earn more later in their life, maybe because of their sociological background, uh, it turns out they will also make long studies. Uh, so how can we evaluate the, the causal effect of, of schooling and whether it's really useful? Um, and why is this question important? Because uh, we, we should, um, if we follow economic theory, then we should uh, 
enroll people into school as long as uh, the return to schooling are higher as the cost of, uh, of teaching. Yes, so because of omitted variable and reverse causality, as I just explained, you, you cannot uh, really simply compare the, the wages of people who did uh, long studies and those who did short studies. So to causally identify the effect on income on, of one additional year of schooling, we can use an instrument. What is an instrument? It's a variable that will affect income only through its effect on schooling duration. So there is a causal link between the instrument and income, but all this link, all the mechanism goes through schooling duration. And so when there is a, a variation on this variable, it creates an exogenous variation in the duration of schooling, which in terms will affect income, and uh, we can uh, identify the causal effect of schooling duration because uh, we know it's uh, due to something else. It's not, uh, it's not due to another omitted variable. So what they use in practice for this uh, paper as an instrument is the month of birth. Indeed, the month of birth affects schooling duration because there is a law that uh, says you, people should attend uh, school until at least 16. And those who are born in January, they, they then uh, they cannot um, drop out school in the same year as those who are born in December. Uh, those who are born in December can uh, drop out uh, earlier because they, they start school in the, when they are young, uh, younger. Uh, did I? Maybe it's the contrary what I just said, I think. Anyway, um, so th there is 25% uh, of potential dropouts um, uh, that are born um, born yeah, okay, no, so among those who are born at the beginning of the year and, uh, and who are potential dropouts, 25% uh, uh, remain uh, one more year in school um, due to this law. And so here the identification, identification assumption is that the month of birth has no influence on income other than through the duration of schooling. So basically, the identification assumption is that uh, astrology is bullshit because uh, your zodiac sign has no influences on your future income uh, or, uh, yeah, it's, it's assumed to be random the, the month where people are born and not related to any other uh, sociological variable or any explanatory factor. And, um, yeah, do, do, do you want that I explain uh, once again uh, how does it work, this uh, instrumental variable estimation? Oh, it's fine. Yeah? So, okay, so between those who are born in, uh, in January and those who are born in December, there are some people that will not um, have the same duration of schooling because of this difference in the month of birth. Um, because uh, those who are born in uh, December, they enter school at uh, an earlier age. And so when they get 16, they will have done one more year of schooling as those who are born in January, like one month after. So, or one year less, I don't know, I'm confused. But yeah, and so, um, and so, um, and so there are some, some kids who drop out at 16 as soon as they can. And so some uh, who are born uh, in, the, in the right month, they can drop out uh, with having completed one year less of schooling as the others. And this is random, the fact that uh, they, they completed one year more of schooling or one year less of schooling because it's due to their month of birth. And then we can look at their income uh, 10 years later, 20 years later, 
And if we observe that their income um, is higher for those who stayed one year longer, it means that one additional year of schooling has a causal effect on income. Okay. And uh, the finding uh, is that the returns of schooling are in line with those estimated by uh, more rudimentary techniques, uh, simple regression, ordinarily square, which is reassuring for what has been done before. Yes, and Angris didn't stop here. Uh, he studied uh, extensively returns to education and uh, not only the duration of schooling, but uh, many different things. For example, uh, in another paper with Levy, he found that the class size matter. If you reduce the, 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 the size of the class, people learn better and, and earn more later on. And um, he also um, disproved uh, Becker's hypothesis that I talked last time about uh, of a trade-off between child quality and child quantity. So Becker hypothesized that with uh, that, that, that family face a trade-off uh, between the, the number of child and the education level they can uh, provide to their child. And so, uh, and, and actually, uh, Baker observed the correlation between large families and uh, lower diplomas. But uh, Angrist um, rejected this because uh, he showed this was just a correlation, but it was not causal. How did, he, how did he do? He used the sex of the second child as an instrument for the number of children because most people prefer to have uh, children of different sexes. So say they, they, their first uh, child is a boy, then um, they, want, uh, they want a girl. Okay, so they, they, they do another child and um, they're, they're unlucky, their second child is only a boy, is also a boy. So then some of them, they really want a girl, so they will do a third child. But these people, if they had had a girl as a second child, they would have stopped here. And, uh, and we, show, we, we see this in the data that uh, couples that uh, have uh, the, the two first children with the same sex have more chances to have a third, children, third child. And this is a, a random uh, variation in the family size because uh, the sex of your second children is random. Um, the, in this paper, they also use the fact to have twins, which is also random in the family size. Mm -hmm. And they show that uh, families that are larger uh, because of uh, random reasons, uh, they have the, the same, uh, their, their kids have the same, uh, obtain the same diploma in the end as uh, family, smaller families. All right, and uh, Guido Imbens, the third one, is a pure econometrician, uh, whereas the, the, the first two others uh, contributed uh, to, to applied work. Guido Imbens uh, only did theory, and is most famous for developing the theory of uh, instrumental variables, IV. Um, with Angrist and Rubin, they reframe uh, instrumental variable into a Rubin causal model, that you have surely seen if you have studied econometrics. It's a, it's a canonical and it's a simple model, a uh, simple framework for causal inference. Uh, it's a yeah, it's, it's basic way to, 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 to think about these things. And um, yes, with Engrist, uh, he shed light on the notion of a local average treatment effect. So, what is a local average treatment effect? It's what is actually uh, estimated using an IV regression. So to understand that, uh, let's go back to the schooling example. Um, inspired by the terminology in medicine, we call an early month of birth as the intention to treat. Okay, it's like, uh, imagine you're a doctor, you want to estimate the causal effect of a new treatment. Uh, you will take uh, two groups, two random groups of patients. To one group, you give the treatment. To one group, you don't give the treatment. This is a treated group, the control group. 
The thing is that in the treatment group, some people uh, will not take the treatment or will not take it correctly. This is why there is a difference between the intention to treat, being in this group, and uh, being treated. Uh, so they, they use the, um, the, the same uh, distinction for IV regression. So here, the intention to treat is the month of birth, whether you're born in January or uh, in December, for example. And the treatment is to drop out at 16. So uh, some people, whatever, uh, when they are born, they will uh, go to the university and, uh, and they will not be treated in the sense that uh, they, they will not drop out uh, school uh, at 16. Uh, or uh, so they will not have uh, this, uh, the, yeah, they will not be treated. And uh, the thing is that um, the, the, the effect on the outcome, which is the, the income in the, in the adult uh, life, is only measured on these people who drop out at 16. Okay, we cannot uh, understand what would have happened to uh, those who stay in the university if they completed one additional year of schooling. Let's say uh, one master instead of just one bachelor. So, the intention to treat is assumed to be randomly drawn. Okay, December or January, it's random. But there are two non-random groups, the compliance, those who are treated if they are in the intention to treat group, so those who drop out uh, at 16 um, instead of uh, so yeah when they are uh, in the um, when they are born uh, at the beginning of the year. So or said uh, in a better way, those who have uh, one um, additional year of schooling uh, when they are in the born in the, in the right month, and the non-compliance, those for which uh, being born in the right month doesn't affect their uh, schooling duration because they, they, they study longer in any case. So, yeah. So the IV method measures the average treatment effect on the compliance only, only on those who take the treatment, so only on those who uh, have a lower schooling duration because of the instrument. So it's a local effect. It's an effect on this subgroup. And one needs an extra assumption to infer the treatment effect on the whole population. To infer the returns uh, on schooling to the whole population, we have to assume that uh, the returns of schooling are the same for those who drop out at 16 and for those who don't. That the treatment effect is the same among non-compliance and compliance. Okay, and um, yeah, I think I forgot something in the slide of Engrist, is that uh, he's uh, really famous for uh, his textbook, uh, Mostly Harmless Econometrics, and uh, actually I think he, with uh, Pischke, and they um, published uh, recently uh, a new textbook which, is, uh, which probably improves over uh, mostly harmless econometrics. I think it's uh, Mastering Metrics. So it's, uh, it's quite short, like uh, 200, 300 pages, and it reads uh, easily. So if you want uh, an easy introduction to econometrics, uh, I recommend that. All right, so um, I concluded the last lecture with uh, an introduction to new Keynesianism, where I explained that uh, Keynesian economists introduced uh, two uh, assumptions um, to explain why government intervention is needed and why markets uh, left uh, on their own uh, will create involuntary unemployment and are unstable. These two assumptions are sticky prices and mon monopolistic competitions. So sticky prices is the fact that prices do not adjust instantly 
to new conditions um, in the economy. Uh, and if they would adjust instantly, uh, and if there were perfect competition, then economy would be uh, always uh, efficient, and there would be indeed no um, no role for government intervention. Okay, let me. So that's. Um, there is no Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, I'll continue. So, um, why? Uh, oh, maybe, yeah. Why would uh, prices be sticky in the first place? Uh, Fisher and um, yeah, it's quite annoying for yeah. There is no internet. Okay. Edrum, not sure I. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always a nightmare to connect to edge room. Um, maybe this one. Um, does it work? Okay, so. Um, so some uh, Fisher and Phelps who won the Nobel Prize uh, provided uh, a simple justification to, to rigidity in prices, um, which is called, and in wages actually, um, it's easier to think about it in terms of wages, um, and it's called the staggered wages. They observed that uh, wages are, f are fixed uh, in nominal contracts, for, so when you sign a work contract, your wage is defined in nominal terms, like a certain amount in francs, for the next few years. And uh, if there is inflation or if there is a variation in, in, in prices or in conditions of uh, your company, they cannot change your wage uh, every month to uh, adapt they have to wait uh, at least one year or, yeah, so there is some rigidity. And, uh, and Fisher um, provides this justification and also, sh also shows that the policy ineffectiveness proposition from Sargent and Wallace rests on the flexibility of prices rather than on the assumption of rational expectation. I recall this proposition, it says that monetary policy is ineffective as long as it's systematic. Like uh, the government can fool people once but uh, cannot fool people a thousand times. And uh, if at each recession the central bank or the government lowers the interest rates, then people with rational expectation will anticipate it and so uh, will adjust their, their labor supply. Uh, consequently, uh, they, the, the policy, w the monetary policy would be ineffective because to be effective, it uh, would have to, to rest on the fact that uh, the real wage um, diminishes because um, inflation uh, happens, uh, and, uh, but, but not uh, wage inflation. Wages uh, stay the same in nominal, way, in nominal terms. And uh, workers are fooled into thinking that uh, there is no inflation, uh, and so um, and so they accept the, the the new job offers made by the employer employers um, because um, and employers make uh, more job offers because the real wage has decreased. 
But this uh, also, uh, this ineffectiveness proposition rests on the flexibility of uh, wages. Um, and, uh, and if you drop this uh, flexibility assumption, then you reintroduce the Keynesian effect. There is another way in which... Um, uh, wait a minute. There is a, another. Yes, hi everyone. I'm sorry about um, about the connection problem. Uh, it was a Wi-Fi problem in and DTH. Oh, thank you for telling me. Yeah, I was saying um, there was a connection issue. I'm sorry about that. Um, So, so yeah, I was saying that the, um, the reason why prices would be sticky is because of staggered wages. So uh, wages are, are fixed uh, in nominal terms and uh, cannot be changed uh, frequently. And the, the second reason is a menu cost. So menu cost uh, is called that way because it's the price of uh, changing the menu in a restaurant, the, the price of printing a new menu. Uh, but actually, it's not, of course, not the, the price of, of printing the menu that matters, uh, but it's the cost of uh, upsetting customers uh, if you change the price uh, every week in your menu. Uh, and also uh, because it takes time and attention to, to change prices frequently. Uh, although uh, the loss of not changing them would be small. So overall, it, it doesn't uh, make sense for people to, to change uh, prices frequently. Yes? Like one question about um, when we ask why the prices are steep, so how does the um, theory of staggered wages would then also explain sticky prices? I mean, sticky wages, yes? Yeah. Like why, why? Okay. Before we said that maybe wages are less flexible than, than prices also in the... In the okay, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Is uh, uh, the question is: we, we talking about are we talking about uh, sticky prices or sticky wages? So actually, there are there are both. Um, both are, are related and different, and uh, both assumptions are made, or sometimes only one of them, uh, by new Canadians. So uh, so staggered wages it's more for wages. That's true. Uh, the menu cost is more for prices. Um, yeah. And then uh, came Calvo, uh, who proposed a, a simple model uh, where only a fraction of the goods of the product um, can change their price at a given period. So let's say uh, half of the firms can change the, the price of their goods uh, in uh, even years, and the other half can change the price of their goods only in odd years. So it's an unrealistic assumption, of course, but uh, it's easy to write down mathematically, and uh, it amounts to the, the same uh, phenomenon as the, the more complicated way to model it. So um, this is the, the Calvo pricing that was adopted in most modeling work. And uh, all these uh, ways to model uh, rigidity in prices or wages have in common to justify government intervention. Uh, because prices and wages cannot uh, adjust uh, to their efficient level. Then the second assumption introduced by New Canadian is monopolistic competition. So there are different kinds of imperfect competition. There is monopoly, where uh, there is only uh, one firm in a given market, uh, which can then set the price as high as uh, they want and, uh, and earn a lot of uh, rent, of profit. Oligopoly, when you have uh, only a small number of firms um, sharing the, the, the market, like Pepsi and Cola, for example, and Coca. When you have barriers to entry, for example, because uh, we need a patent to, to enter uh, as a new firm in a, in a market. Um, and there is product differentiation, 
which is also called monopolistic competition. So I'll explain it in a minute. Um, Benassi showed that under imperfect competition, you don't need uh, the rigidity of price assumption. You can have the flexible price and um, it suffices to have an equilibrium where adjoints optimize, but with involuntary unemployment. So you get the Keynesian effects only with monopolistic competition. Uh, you, you don't even need um, um, rigid prices. Chamberlain uh, in the 30s was the first to propose a theory of uh, monopolistic competition with many firms, uh, with free entry, meaning that uh, the number of firms in the market uh, varies and uh, new firms can enter the market if they think it's profitable or firms can exit the market if it's not profitable anymore. And uh, so, so it's competitive in this sense, there are, there are many firms, but it's monopolistic in the sense that each firm has some market power due to uh, product differentiation. So uh, you can think of um, brands of cars, okay, to, to, to a certain extent uh, uh, Toyota and uh, Mercedes are substitutes but only to a certain extent, because uh, people have uh, different tastes. Some will prefer the Toyota that has some uh, special characteristics and some will prefer the Mercedes. And, uh, and so some people will be uh, ready to pay more for the Toyota um, because of this special characteristic and vice versa. So each firm has some market power and can charge uh, a price slightly higher than uh, the competitive, the perfectly competitive price. Uh, but this view only became popular after uh, Dixit and Stiglitz uh, put it into equation. So um, the way they model it uh, is this way. The utility function, so I should have written u equals, um, is a function in function of the, the consumption of each product, Ci is the, the consumption of product I, takes this form. So if you have uh, mu, which measures the, the taste for var variety, if you have mu equal one, then uh, the utility function is just the, the sum of uh, all the consumption. So, um, so say uh, you take uh, apples and bananas, um, if mu equals one, uh, your utility is the sum of uh, apples and bananas. So you will just buy the, the cheapest between the two. Uh, if, if you have the choice between uh, two apples, two bananas, or one apple, one banana, you will buy uh, two apples because it's cheaper than two bananas. And you would have, you would have the same utility as uh, if you had uh, one banana and one apple. But now, if you increase mu, if you increase the taste for a variety, then um, you see that the, 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 the you, can, you can see that the curvature of, uh, of, the, the, of the consumption of each good um, increases. Uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, decreases with. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a concave uh, shape, and so uh, you prefer to have uh, one apple and one banana rather than two apples, and you are ready to to pay a bit more. To, to buy uh, one banana instead of a second apple. Now, assuming that firms have a fixed cost and a constant marginal cost. So this means that uh, to, produ to produce one unit of a good, uh, I, the firm uh, I, has to incur uh, a fixed cost, like buy machines, buy uh, uh, build a plant, etc. And then to produce one additional unit of uh, good eye, the firm uh, will uh, incur the same price, the same cost, the marginal cost MC. And this is increasing return in the sense that the average cost decreases with the number of uh, units produced. So, uh, so you have a uh, increasing return or economies of scales. 
In this case, they show that the price of the good uh, will be equal to uh, the marginal cost times uh, mu, which is the markup, and which happens to be equal to the taste for variety. And remember, we have a free entry of firm. So what will determine the number of firms at the optimal in the market? It's the a no profit condition. So if it's still profitable for a firm to enter, a, a new firm will enter. And um, this will be the case as long as the price is higher than the average cost. In this model, all firms are identical. Okay, so the price of all products will be the same. So it's a very simplified model. Um, and this is why it was popular. And so uh, when you have uh, this price P of uh, existing firm or new firm, uh, which is uh, uh, above the average cost, a new firm can enter and make a profit. And, uh, and they will do so uh, until uh, yeah, and, 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 and the thing is, when new firms uh, enter, this reduces the number of uh, units uh, produced by each firm. Okay, and the new firm takes some market share to the other firms. So as it reduces CI, it increases the average cost and uh, new firms will enter, increasing the average cost until the point where the price is equal to the average cost. You have any question? Um, okay. The, the, the bottom line thing to remember is that uh, new Keynesians um, changed the SGE models, so dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models, which are the, the, the way uh, the, the workhorse uh, macroeconomic models. With respect to RBC models, they changed it because they, they by, by replacing the perfect competition flexible price assumptions by a monopolistic competition and sticky price assumptions. And by so doing, the new Keynesian's DSG model justified demand activation, government intervention. Yes? Okay, the question is uh, why uh, would we have the price equals the marginal cost? Why would the average cost change uh, with the number of firms? So the average cost is, um, is not constant. Um, let me uh, draw. So um, here uh, is the, the cost. Here it's uh, the number of, uh, of product uh, I produced. To produce uh, one good, you have a fixed cost. And then, uh, and then you have a constant marginal cost, which means a constant slope here. This is uh, MC. And so this is the total cost. Okay, now the average cost, you have to divide this number by, uh, by this number, by the, the number of goods produced. So here, it's, uh, it's close to infinity, and uh, as you increase the number uh, of units, you will converge to, uh, to the marginal cost MC. Uh, because the fixed cost here, will not matter when you, when you produce an infinity of good. Uh, it will just be the marginal cost divided by the, I mean, the, yeah, the marginal cost will be the average cost. Yeah. You want, I can write it in equations if you want. Um, if you want, you have the, yeah. So when uh, new firms enter the market, the total amount of production will increase? Ah, uh, yeah, no, no, actually, actually, no. That's the thing. So uh, in this model, when new firms uh, enter into the market, uh, the total amounts uh, produced, the sum of the CI, will stay the same. 
and so uh, and so the the, the 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 number of units produced by each firm will reduce because uh, more firms will share the same uh, pie if you want the same uh, total amount so when a new firm enter uh, it takes uh, market share to the other firms so the number of units firm uh, the number of units sold by each firm reduces which uh, increases the average cost and, uh, and, and as long as it's profitable to enter, as long as the average cost is below the equilibrium price, new firm, new firm will enter. All right? Okay. Um, now, uh, new Keynesians also uh, reintroduced uh, money uh, at the forefront of the picture. Because remember, with the real business cycles model, real means that uh, there is no money because Kidlan and Prescott thought that uh, monetary policy was ineffective and uh, there was no need then to, to model it. Uh, Christopher Sims uh, won the Nobel Prize for his study of uh, the effect of monetary policy, actually. So he started his career by um, trying to figure out uh, which theory was right between Friedman and Keynes, between the monetarists and Keynes, regarding to uh, monetary policy. And uh, he found using uh, new statistical techniques that uh, he brought uh, that it was uh, Friedman uh, who was right. But then a few years later, uh, he was unhappy with his uh, result. And, um, and he came to the conclusion that uh, both uh, theories were equally wrong. Uh, because uh, both of them made the same mistake as viewing monetary policy as exogenous, uh, something that's outside the model and uh, that uh, the policymakers can, can decide and can, you know, as they see fit. But um, he argued that uh, monetary policy, and maybe policy in general, is better seen as uh, a response, a behavioral response of government to uh, the current circumstances, and we should model that as well. And so he, he proposed to um, endogenize uh, monetary policy in the models. And then, uh, yeah. And, and then came Taylor, uh, who presented uh, an, an empirical regularity in the data. Um, but uh, people uh, really liked uh, what, what he was uh, showing and um, turned it into a policy recommendation. And uh, Central Bank uh, became very interested in, in Taylor's uh, insights uh, and uh, and took it as a, as a guide for their monetary policy, uh, while Taylor uh, was just presenting it as a, a way to, to represent past data, to understand past uh, data. So in the Taylor rule, the central banks adjust the interest rate in function of two different objectives. The central bank has an inflation target. So for the European Central Bank, for example, it's 2%. And actually, the European Central Bank is, uh, is a bit uh, particular because they're in the, the in statutes, it is the only objective of the ECB. Uh, but for the Fed in the US, uh, the both, both objectives are really uh, in the statutes. It's uh, low and stable inflation, but not zero. And um, to have output equals to its potential. So what is the potential output? It's the level of activity, Y star, that can be sustained in the long run. So when, uh, yeah, and I will denote X, the level of activity, the GDP, minus uh, Y, minus Y star, uh, the potential output. So X is called the output gap. So when X is negative, it means that output is below its potential. Uh, because, for example, there is uh, unemployed people, because there is uh, underused uh, capacities uh, in, in, uh, in uh, capital. 
And uh, when X is positive, it means that the economy experiences uh, overheating. Uh, for example, uh, people have to work uh, 50 hours a week and it's not sustainable in the long run. And um, the output, uh, the potential output Y star is, uh, is an abstract concept and, uh, and so it's hard to measure. Um, the way it's usually done is to by just uh, prolonging the trend of uh, past uh, GDP, uh, but uh, it's uh, subject to, con to criti criticism. So now uh, here is the Taylor rule. So um, for the beginning, forget about the, the two last terms. Imagine that the, police, the, the, the economy is, uh, has reached the inflation targets, so P equals P star, and uh, output is at its potential, Y equals Y star, so the two last terms are equal to zero. You notice that there is another star, so another uh, target, which is the natural rate of interest, so, which is all, again something hard to measure, and uh, subject to criticism, uh, but the, the idea of the, the R star, it's uh, the, the interest, the real interest rate that um, equates saving and investment. So the, the interest rate that should prevail um, in the economy. And so uh, the, the terror rule says that uh, the nominal interest rate set by the central bank should be equal to the real interest rate plus the inflation. That's when uh, the targets are reached. Now, when the economy is uh, not at its target, there are, um, there are rules specifies that it should uh, go in the direction uh, to the target. So when pi, when the inflation is, uh, is above uh, the targeted inflation pi star, this term is positive, meaning that uh, the nominal interest rate i have to be increased with respect to the case with, uh, uh, where, where the, the, tar the targets are met. And uh, why would it work to reduce inflation? Because a higher interest rate implies a decrease in investment and um, a decrease in the level of activity of the economy and in fine a decrease in inflation. When uh, the output gap is uh, negative, when there is a recession, then uh, this is the contrary, the nominal interest rate should be reduced to uh, stimulate the economy stimulate activity. And you see there is a, a compromise to be made between these two objectives because they are sometimes uh, in com like they, they go in, uh, in opposite direction. If you have a recession and in a recession you want to, to decrease I and if you have at the same time inflation you want to increase I. And to solve the to solve the 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 to the the the, the different uh, objectives to find a balance between them there are uh, weights ap and ay so the higher ap relative to ay uh, the higher weight is given to uh, the inflation target and vice versa Taylor uh, found that uh, a while equals a uh, p equals one half uh, is a, a, good, a good fit for uh, monetary policy. So, uh, in a sense, it would uh, amount to giving the same weight to the inflation target and to the output target. So, the advantages of the Taylor rule is that it's simple. So that's why it has been uh, so widely uh, accepted and popular. Uh, it's useful for central bank decision making because it provides them a, a way to, to, to decide uh, what interest rate to set. And it has an excellent empirical fit. It's, uh, it seems to correspond to, to what central bank actually do. 
The problem uh, is that it's backward looking. It doesn't take into account uh, anticipations of agent, but uh, we've seen that it's anticipation that matters. Uh, what we want is, uh, uh, I mean, what, uh, what will um, produce uh, the future level of activity uh, is uh, the anticipation of agent for a large part. And here they don't enter into the picture. It's not micro-funded. We don't understand why would this be the objective of the central bank. The central bank, uh, it can be argued that uh, it should uh, optimize social welfare. That is what uh, Woodford uh, actually did. And uh, we'll see in a few slides, uh, it provides a modified Taylor rule. Same kind of, of thing, but, uh, but that's micro-funded with um, with the, 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 the equation, the behavioral equation of the central bank um, comes from an optimi optimizing behavior. And other problems, it neglects uh, other potential objectives like the stability of the financial sector. And it neglects also other instruments uh, as, uh, than the interest rates. But the central bank can act on other instruments uh, as we see in quantitative easing and so on. Also, it um, emphasizes on a new trade-off between the variability of output and the variability of inflation. Because uh, the central bank was to stabilize both at the same time, but there is a trade-off between the two. Is there any question on the Taylor rule? Okay. Um, now, um, New Keynesian's uh, DSG models uh, introduce monopolistic competition, sticky prices in the form of uh, Calvo pricing, and uh, Rothenberg and Woodford, which is a seminal paper uh, in this trend of literature, uh, introduce a welfare maximizing central bank. And they find what uh, Galli and Blanchard call the divine coincidence, that stabilizing inflation also minimizes the output gap. So they kill two birds with one stone, and uh, it's, it's quite dubious that uh, it's somehow the, the trade-off uh, of the Taylor rule disappeared. Because uh, when, they, to, when they reach one objective, which is stabilizing inflation, they also reach the second one. Why is that so? Because with Calvo pricing, only a fraction of the firm can adjust their prices. So when you have inflation, it's inflation only on half of the prices, which means that there is a dispersion between prices. Some prices are high and some prices uh, have to wait one period to get higher. And this dispersion in prices means that some prices are false. And this creates inefficiencies in the economy. So then, and, and also the, the thing is that these inefficiencies in this model are the only source of business fluctuation, is the only source of imperfection. And this is why stabilizing inflation will stabilize the economy as a whole and will avoid uh, recession business fluctuation in this model. So this was criticized and uh, Clarida, Galli and Gertler um, became the new uh, baseline, uh, the, the new Canadian workhorse. It includes um, three main equations. So we also have uh, representative agents and I put here uh, the three equations uh, for the record. I, I don't have time to comment on them, but I can if, if you want, if you have some questions on them. Um, and then, five years later, uh, Cristiano and uh, their co-authors uh, identified some problems with uh, this model. In particular, it was not able to replicate uh, the behavior of the economy after a monetary shock. And uh, they showed that this could be fixed by uh, refining the, number, the, the model and uh, adding a number of assumptions. Uh, so they added uh, Calvo wages and not only Calvo prices. This turned out to be uh, critical uh, to, to improve uh, the, the empirical fit of the model. 
They introduced habit formation. Habit formation is another way of modeling utility, where utility doesn't only depend on the current consumption level, it also depends on the increase or decrease in consumption with respect to the previous period. So it says that you're not only happy because you consume a lot, you're happy also because you increase more than you consume more than before. And you're unhappy if you consume less than before. Um, they also introduced uh, variable capital utilization and uh, uh, beginning of the financial sector because uh, yeah, firms have uh, to borrow from banks to finance themselves. And then uh, came Smets and uh, Wouters who estimated this model uh, using Bayesian techniques, uh, so state-of-the-art uh, techniques to, to find the values of the parameters of this model. For example, the sigma here, the lambda, the, and, um, and this uh, work by uh, Smith and Wouters um, became widely accepted, uh, so much that central banks finally adopted the SGE models. Before them, central banks uh, didn't, they have never used the RBC models because they found it uh, too bad. Uh, so they, they, they kept using um, models uh, inspired by uh, Klein, models by Klein, so neo-Keynesians uh, with big model, Keynesians model from the 50s. Nowadays, central banks use, uh, still use this neo-Keynesians model and they also use DSG models. The problem is that, so, uh, so yeah, we reached a, a time, so in the beginning of the years 2000, where uh, the DSG program was uh, come to stabilization. Macroeconomists were super happy because they, they, they thought uh, they, they had found uh, the good model of the macroeconomy, and they had reconciled new classical economists with uh, new Keynesian economists. But then the crisis came up, uh, that exposed the limitation of uh, these models because these models are unable to model uh, and explain or predict the crisis of 2007. And uh, this is because they, they are still uh, quite rudimentary. There is no heterogeneity in this model. There is just one representative agent. There is no um, unemployment or unemployment is, is modeled as a, just a decrease in, the, in the, the number of hours worked. And there is uh, no coordination failure. Uh, there is sticky prices and monopolistic competition, but uh, that's all. So uh, these models are still unrealistic and subject to the no exploitation principle of Lucas that says that uh, you should not draw policy recommendation from these models because uh, we, they are too uh, far from reality. So, so yes, so, so the macroeconomy uh, at this macroeconomics at this stage is, uh, is still in shambles because, because we know that uh, these DSG model uh, have, uh, have some problems. Um, but still there is a, a new consensus uh, around these new Keynesian models because uh, perhaps we, we don't have uh, anything better and uh, also because uh, new classical economists and uh, RBC models have accepted the changes uh, of that new Keynesian um, offered to their models. So this new consensus is also called the new neoclassical synthesis or simply new Keynesianism. So to, to sum up, new Keynesians uh, gave up their er earlier models with involuntary unemployment and they adopted the methodology set forth by Lucas, so the DSG standard that you should model the economy at equilibrium, an intertemporal equilibrium with stochastic shocks and uh, with agents that are uh, rational, with rational expectations. They added to uh, RBC models, though the first DSG models, uh, the sticky price and monopolistic competition assumptions, as well as the Taylor rule, the, 
new Keynesian terror rules. And new classical macroeconomists, in turn, uh, they gave up money neutrality, the, the idea that uh, monetary policy is ineffective, and they gave up the assumptions of flexible prices and perfect competition, uh, and converged to uh, new Keynesian models. Most of RBC models, actually, um, accepted the, the new Keynesian changes. So here, uh, I tried to, to sum up uh, the different models uh, that um, I have uh, presented in class. It's an approximatory, uh, approximate summary because uh, it's, uh, it's impossible to, to summarize in one word uh, uh, what does a model with respect to, uh, I don't know, expectation or unemployment or, or so on, but, but still gives a, um, a rough picture. I think the, the most important lines are the second and the third. The, 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 the second line uh, distinguish models uh, that justify government intervention and those who don't. And uh, the third line uh, shows that uh, before the, uh, the 70s, uh, models did not, uh, were not micro-funded. They modeled uh, variables, the, the relationship with aggregate, between aggregate variables. Um, and just that. Whereas uh, since the 70s, uh, models are microfunded in the sense that this aggregate relationship between variables emerge from an underlying optimization program of the agents. And uh, I'll conclude with uh, two words about the, the current and future uh, state of macroeconomics. What are the, the path? Uh, beyond the SG modeling. Uh, first one, which is uh, trendy, is uh, heterogeneous agent new Keynesian models. Uh, Kaplan, Moll, and Violent, Violent uh, coined uh, Hank for, uh, as the abbreviation of, of these models. And they introduced its heterogeneity, in particular heterogeneity in wealth which uh, changes um, the recommendation, the, the, the conclusion of the models. In particular, it's labor demand and not labor supply that mediates monetary policy. So in DSG models, the reason why uh, policy has some effect on the economy is because uh, agents substitute uh, labor uh, and leisure and uh, change their labor decision facing a change in uh, wages. But this lacks some uh, credibility because it's not consistent with what, what, we observe, what we observe because this would imply that people uh, really change their, their number of hours a lot, which they don't, according to, to changing wages. And uh, with their model, they, they show that um, it's, uh, the effect of monetary policy can be transmitted through labor demand uh, by firms. I don't enter into the detail. Um, it's for sure an improvement with respect to DSG models that are with a one representative agent, but I think it's still liable to the no exploitation principle. I mean, to some extent. I mean, it's just maybe these models are good uh, for recommendation around monetary policy, because this is their goal, actually, is to understand monetary policy, but uh, they should not um, be taken as uh, a good representation of the economy as a whole, and uh, cannot be used beyond what they are made for, that is monetary policy. And then uh, another uh, way to model the economy would be um, through agent-based modeling. So inspired from statistical physics, actually there are many physis physicists that, turns, uh, that turn economists, and uh, who want to model the economy as it is somehow, just a miniature version of the economy with many different agents, uh, heterogeneous, uh, each with a behavior, behavioral rule, so they, they react to the information they receive, and uh, they, they, they make decisions in saving, labor, like, like always, but they also um, 
uh, interact with others by exchanging information and goods. And uh, these models are um, very um, used in, in some domains, uh, like um, when you want to design a transportation system. Okay, you want to, to know uh, where to build uh, the new metro line, then uh, you can uh, infer from survey uh, who goes uh, where, when, and uh, find uh, the optimal way to design the, your, your subway um, in function of that. Because uh, it works well because we know well uh, the behavior of people and um, and, uh, and we know well the, the, the data, what reality is. It's much more uh, difficult to do for macroeconomy as a whole. And uh, although it can be a promising way, uh, we can doubt that uh, we will find uh, an agent-based uh, model that uh, is uh, accepted by any. And uh, most probably, uh, we can have two different agent-based models that reproduce past data equally well, but uh, have different prediction. And then how could you choose between uh, the two of them? So, um, in a sense, uh, macro... Uh, yes, you have a question? Sorry, have different predictions. Have different predictions. So, you can have so two different models that uh, w when you try to, to see uh, which one is, is the best, uh, you, you cannot see a difference because uh, the, both of them uh, reproduce well enough uh, past observations, okay? But these models are different. They have different assumptions, they have uh, different equations, and so they will result in uh, different uh, prediction for the future and in different policy recommendations. So, um, so, so, and I mean, this is a problem with agent-based model, but it's also a problem with DSG model. You can build two different DSG models uh, that uh, that uh, work equally well for the past, but uh, are, have different predictions. So, um, so yeah. Just a last word on agent-based model is just it's uh, it it goes uh, away from uh, the notion of equilibrium. Uh, it uh, acknowledges that the economy is a complex system and, uh, and it works with simulation, um, lots of simulation rather than uh, finding, computing the equilibrium. Um, so yes, just uh, uh, a concluding word is that uh, the macroeconomy is, uh, is a complex system, that's for sure, and uh, maybe too complex uh, for us to understand it well. And uh, at this stage, th there is no uh, way we can properly model uh, the macroeconomy as a whole. Every model has its deficiency, and uh, we don't see uh, a solution as to uh, how, how to, uh, to have a consensual model uh, that everyone uh, would accept. And uh, that's, that's something that even, uh, even uh, Smets and Wouters, who, the, I mean, uh, who build the, the, the model that is the, the most uh, used uh, these days, uh, they would agree and they would say, uh, yes, I, I don't trust my model. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>